So our presenter today, Tiana Hippolyte, is a Māori woman working as a schools engagement officer at Griffith University to engage Māori and Pacifica students. Though she is scientifically trained with a Bachelor of Biomedical Science and completing a Master's of Medical Research, she relies on the already developed LEAD program and inspiration from her mentors, family, friends, and personal experiences in the community and higher education for all her program designs. Thank you, Kobe. All right. So thank you for that introduction. Yes, my name is Tiana um, and thank you for joining me. So I am a Schools and Pacific Engagement Officer from Griffith University and I'm excited to talk about some of the three main themes that I came across in my role that I took on this year, which is influencers, weavers and learners. Um, first off, I acknowledge the people or the traditional custodians of the land of which I'm calling from, which is the Yungu Bear and the Yagara people. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. So with this session, um, I'm going to be upfront, I am new, so I am going to be speaking about my experiences that I've learned throughout this year because I this is the first time that I've stepped into the space. Uh, so I know that I'm talking to experts. You guys are the ones who are on the floor, who are constantly interacting with our youth and know what methods work or don't work. And so I'm coming from a voice of a generation that has come from New Zealand and has navigated the struggles or the different climates with higher education. So this is just me engaging with you and sharing all of the things that I've learned throughout this year. Okay, so to start off, I just wanted to throw it out to you guys. Um, is anyone here willing to share some of the influences that have impacted them through their education journey and maybe share why they had such an influence on them? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll share. Um, I'm Renuka, I'm a careers advisor at Granville South High School. For me, uh, who were my influences would have to be my parents. Um, my parents both. Uh, my dad grew up in Fiji. Um, my mom grew up in Europe, you know, Yugoslavia. So for me um, and for them that struggled with education, they um, came to Australia at a very young age and were working. Um, so for me, they just wanted the best um, for me and for, for my sisters. And that meant, you know, um, you know, university, aspiring to go to university, um, you know, get a good education, get a good job. Um, yeah, those were some of those influences that I had. Yeah, no, for sure. That is amazing. And parents play such a key role in every sort of student's and children's life. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I can also attest that my parents have a big influence on me um, through me attaining higher education. I'll share a little bit about that later. Um, are there any other inputs that you guys want to add? Um, Sela put in the yeah. chat uh, faith and family. She said, my faith has always been embedded in what I do and how I navigate through life. And my family has a huge influence in shaping my identity as a Pacifica woman. Mm -hmm. Yes, amazing. And faith is really important as well because it does play such a key role in a lot of our cultures. And as Joji was saying, like Pacifica isn't homogenized. There are different cultures, but that is something that um, we all just share. Just um, I've just seen a new work laptop. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hello. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Um, just to add on to the influences, I would like to add my parents. I think both my parents were born in Fiji and lived at a time where there was a bit of tension between the Indians and the natives. But my parents kind of promoted a culture of unity, not in the so not a culture where you know the Indians and the, Indians, the natives are the natives, but more you know we're all Fijians kind of thing. And that kind of shaped my identity in how I viewed myself in, in that tension. Um, over the past couple of years, I have to say it's been the students of the school that I'm working at 
see their pride in their culture and they're coming from has kind of helped me uh, connect to my own background and who I, who I am as well. So, yeah, so my parents and the students at school. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, so our key theme here is parents. Parents have such a key role in everybody's life. Um, and if there's so much research that I've read this year saying that as much as the parents are involved with everything in their school and education, uh, it definitely contributes to that success through their, um, to getting through and getting their high school certificate and then even onto higher education. Thank you for sharing with me. I might just add a couple more influences. Um, so it can be like teachers, guidance officers, um, but also finances and citizenship. So all of these things can play a big part into a Pacifica youth in Australia um, and how that might affect them going into higher education. Hmm. All right, so these are pictures of a couple of my influences. So yes, this is my family. Um, no, that is not all my family, not because I don't like some of them, uh, just mainly because I didn't have enough room on the slide for all of them. Um, they are both here in Australia and in New Zealand, and they've all played a big part in my life and to where I get, uh, to where I am now. Uh, a part of my role as at Griffith University is to raise and support aspirations for uh, careers and to attain that through higher education, whether that be through TAFE or university. Uh, under my profile, so I do workshops with whole cohorts in schools, but under my profile, uh, I also lead and coordinate the Pacifica LEAD program. So this program has been going on since 2011, and it's been delivered in schools across Logan, Ipswich, and Gold Coast areas. Um, my role was previously held by Dr. Glenda Stanley and Emma Tanivasa. Um, and so without them, this program wouldn't have existed, uh, but also without their support, I probably wouldn't have been able to achieve everything that was able to go ahead this year. So mad respects to them and absolutely love them. Uh, this is a couple of the things that I've done. So I just chose three of the um, main things that we delivered and was really impactful on me because with that concept of Apple, you can have that teaching moment with your student where you're teaching them, but they can also teach you. So there's that reciprocal feeling. Uh, <laughs> We've got the lead three-day uh, leadership camp. So it's a leadership camp for our year 11s in our schools. And the main purpose of that is to give them the skills and confidence to pursue leadership roles in year 12. So to really go for school captaincy or sports captaincy roles. Uh, that was a great, great journey to try and learn um, because there's so much logistics behind it that I wasn't aware of. Because before I was doing this role, I was a mentor. So I'll just rock up, talk with the kids, have fun, and then I'll go home. Um, but all that background work, I was amazed. I was, my eyes were open. I was like, oh my gosh. I definitely took for granted how much work Blender and Emma would put into something like that. Uh, we also had a lead on campus experience day, which was for year 10s. So we brought them onto our Logan campus and they were able to hear from speakers from Kalani Purcell, who's like the captain of the Tall Ferns team, Tall Blacks. Um, the Dr. Quinn Lady Chang Wai and Dr. Luke Ward, who are practicing medical doctors, and Dr. Harry Kanasa, who is a doctor of philosophy and science and education. So it was really cool to get them involved. And then they were able to also interact with our university mentors who developed and facilitated workshops based on their degrees. So we had a lawyer, a business uh, accounting student, and a social worker. So they were able to emerge those students through different experiences in that way. Um, and then Tutavati. So this one was new this year. And that came about because I was going along to the Pacifica Women's Alliance meeting. So they had just a general meeting with all of their members. And so that alliance is a not-for-profit organization for the community for, to empower Pacifica women in our area. And so in that meeting, we were talking with a lot of the wiser generation who are more experienced than me. And they raised this concern of not knowing how to educate or approach certain topics for with the younger generation about 
what love looks like. And they were concerned that the young generation were going elsewhere and seeking out information from external sources. And so we had to try and facilitate a safe space for them to approach that topic with their daughters. Um, but also we split them up so that the daughters didn't feel too intimidated or uncomfortable and the mothers also. Um, and when we did that, the daughters were able to engage with our mentors and have fun. But the mothers also sort of showed that they needed that space to just talk and talk with other um, people who are like them, who just needed to approach or understand different concepts or approaches towards approaching this topic. So it was a really cool day and um, I really enjoyed it. And it was one of those ones where I was able to pull in different people. So we had people from Pacifica Women's Alliance, Pacifica Young People's Wellbeing Network and the Oceania um, Pacific Health Association. And it was one of the easiest events that we conducted this year because so many people were involved and we were all on the same uh, page and we had that sort of sense, synergy. <laughs> so it was really cool to see that happen. Uh, here we go. Now, when I started, I had this strong, very, very strong determination to try and execute lead the exact same way that I had seen it. I, when I was a mentor, I saw Emma conduct it and deliver it the certain way. And in my mind, I was like, I'm going to do it exactly like that. And no matter how hard I tried, and I tried really, really hard, I always found that there was always something different. Uh, and I think it came back to the different styles. So Emma, she had this really fun approach and interactive style where she would crack jokes and laugh all the time. And then Glenda, she was the smart driven one uh, with a clear goal in mind and always hit that uh, point that she wanted to make. And it was to a point of perfection. But for me, I was a bit more reserved, a bit more casual with my approach. Um, but throughout my work, when I reflect on it this year, one thing stood out to me and really drove my work. And that was Fidia Te Tangata. So that was weaving the people together. So that really drove everything to uh, completion. And it was just, it was including bringing in different people from different organizations. So with Tutubati, we brought in PWA, Pipwin, OFA, uh, but also just recognizing all these different people who work together and how they can work together as well. So I don't have to necessarily pull them all together, but I can see over there, we've got these people all doing the same thing, but they don't actually connect to each other because they're not aware of each other. And so everyone's working towards the same goal, doing it the same way, but they're just not connecting. So that's just something that I was able to recognize and then I could help connect those um, connections that needed to be happen. And this really took on a strong theme in my life uh, for more reasons than one. And that is mainly because of my nan. So this is my nana. She, in three weeks into this role, she passed away. She was over in New Zealand. And because of COVID, we weren't able to go back for her tiny. And that having that option or that process of grieving that we are used to in the Maori culture taken away from us, it really impacted myself. And I know my family who are here too. And on top of that, us in Brisbane, we went into a snap lockdown. So we couldn't have our whanau over here come over and share stories. Uh, so that was really, really hard. Um, still is hard because I still haven't been able to go back but I, I just had this void I had this void of um, longing to connect with her somehow uh, I couldn't go back to her marae I couldn't go back to her place of rest um, I had to try and do something here and so two things came to mind connect through a culture and then the other thing is through weaving so when I was eight she gave me her first ever that she made and I think it's her only kuruai so with that argument I would say that I'm the favorite grandchild but my cousins may disagree um <laughs> but with that like that was something that we shared and I was like you know what I'm gonna do it I'm gonna learn how to weave I don't care how long it takes I'm gonna do it and so here we are so I chose to take it up with my nana on my mum's side and my sister who's really pregnant in this photo so she'll be very unhappy with me sharing it so enjoy um yeah and this 
process actually became a source of therapy for me. So it was for grieving, but also for physical um, healing. So I also broke my arm this year. This, this year has been wild, guys. Um, and it was great to be able to just have that moment on Saturday mornings to just sit down and work on the intricacies. I had to learn how to close my fingers again because I could only go that far because I did some nerve damage. And it was nice to also sit down and just contemplate all the things that were going on in my work and my life. And it really made me learn something new again, um, but also put things into context. So I was weaving and as I was weaving, I couldn't help but overlap these themes to the work that I was doing. And so I wanted to share that with you. So this is my first ever cloak or kākahu. Oh, the difference between a kōrōai and a kākahu is that a kōrōai has tassels, whereas a cloak has um, no tassels. So a kākahu is just that. Uh, hope you enjoy it. I, I'm pretty proud of it. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's cool. I did that. Um, and that was woven through uh, the hands of somebody recovering from grief and physical injury. So that's, that's I'm, I'm proud. <laughs> and I was able to connect with my nana through that. Um, and it's just that sense of wider, or well, that spirituality that I was able to feel um, through that process. And then seeing it come to completion was really amazing. And then when you flip it onto the other side, you can really see the mastery or lack thereof. So with a kakahu, uh, to make one, you go from the bottom and you work your way to the top. And so as you can see on the bottom, it's pretty rough. That's me learning how to do it. Uh, three main things for uh, weaving, a kākahu at least, is the fenny, so that goes up and down, so that's that thread. Then you have the aho, which goes from left to right, and you've got your fatu, which is a stitch, so that is what holds the aho and fenny together. Um, and in there you've got a reinforcing row, a feather row, and the reinforcing row is pretty much just to make sure that the cloak doesn't sway too much and it doesn't lose any other feathers or fenu throughout the process. Uh, with this fatu stitch, so that tension of it really makes or breaks what this kākahu can turn out. So if the tension is perfect, your fenu and ahu won't go anywhere. But if it's too tight, uh, your fenu starts to warp and it really starts to make it rigid and go a bit crooked. But if it's too loose, you can create these little gaps that you can see down here. <clears throat> so you really got to be careful to make sure that your tension is right. And then it also shows that as you go across, it becomes more linear, which is what you want to do. So I, as I said, saw this overlapping into the work that I was doing. So I was looking at this as a student. So let's say this is a student who's completed all their education and they're thriving. And then if you look at the back, you can see all these different things that come into play to make that happen. I was thinking of the fenu as time. So that could be a student's day or week. And then the aho is the influences. So these are the influences that we identified earlier being like the parents, so mum, dad, teachers, guidance officers, and depending on the interactions that they had with them in that day or week, really depended on their aspirations for higher education throughout their journey. So that fatu is that interaction that we're going to use today. So this is an example. So this student came over from New Zealand and went straight into high school, went into their classes and was like, hi guidance officer. I'm here to enroll in the classes, what I do. And the guidance officer looked them straight up and down and said, okay, what we'll do is we'll put you into sports program and we won't worry about ATAR classes. Um, and the student coming from New Zealand didn't know what ATAR was. So they're like, oh, what's ATAR? And so the guidance officer, oh, it's the pathway that you go to to go into university, but don't worry about that, it's too hard. And the student's like, well, no, I do want to go into university. Why would I not want to? And she's like, oh, it's because the Australian curriculum is higher, uh, it's, might not be smart enough, and there's a lot of work. So better to just do these classes and you know, be on your way. So the guidance officer proceeded to really enroll them into the non-ATAR curriculum, even though the student really wanted to go into university. So the student went back at home and was like, oh, mum, 
I don't think that I can go into university here, isn't it? I think it's harder than what it is in New Zealand. And the mom's like, what? Why are you saying this? And so she showed the mom the class list that the guidance officer gave her. And was like, oh, because the guidance officer said so. And so the mom went into the office and went into the school and had a few choice words with the guidance officer and saying, how dare you tell my daughter that she is not smart enough to go into university. She was top of her classes in science, maths and English and she's coming here and you're telling her that she can't do it and not even giving her a chance to do so. A few more choice words were said and then the student was able to go under the ATAR pathway. So um, with this analogy, this row here can be likened to that guidance officer. So, so let's say they came across a guidance officer in New Zealand, really supportive, come to Australia, and this one interaction really threw them off that higher education pathway. And luckily the mum came in here and had to sort of fix it and pull them back onto their right pathway. And that was further affirmed with their science teacher and their English teacher saying, you know, your work is really good, um, here are your grades. And then also the Pacifica, Māori and Pacific outreach officers that was in the school at the time um, really helped to reaffirm that person's aspirations for higher education. And that's through understanding and listening. Um, and so without all of these other influences, who knows where that person's aspirations could have ended up. And it's really important to understand that it's not just one person that could make a break. In some cases it is one person that can make a break a person's journey but it often includes more than just the one influencer. Uh, our next student. So this one includes two teachers and a mentor. There are other influences in their lives, but I'm just gonna use three key players here. So we've got teacher, Mr. M and Ms. P and a student mentor from university. So this student has, so this is Mr. M here, the mentor here and another teacher here. So that student has a really good relationship with that teacher here. And the mentor comes along into the school and is like, oh, hey, how are you going? What do you want to do after high school? And without a beat, the student replies, I want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. The mentor was like, dang, you're just in year 10. I'm impressed that you even know what that is. This is how you do it. Let's do it. And so that was great. And then a year later in year 11, the mentor goes back in and approaches the same student and is like, oh, hey, how are you going with your surgeon journey? And the student replies and she's like, oh, I don't think I'll do it anymore. I think I'll do rugby league. And it's a massive change from what they originally wanted to do and was set on. And so the mentor asks why, uh, what's happened? Is there anything that's going on? And so the student proceeds to tell the mentor the story of what happened. And she's saying that this teacher here asked her about what this teacher here asked her about what she wanted to do after high school and she said I want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon and that teacher laughed he had a good relationship with the student but he laughed and he did it probably unconsciously because he thought she was joking but that actually affected her and had a long lasting impact on her and really shifted her aspirations from going into medicine or any sort of health degree into rugby league and then the mentor had to come in, reaffirm that original aspiration, and then also reached out to another teacher in the school who, whenever they saw them at lunchtime or in class, would be like, hey, how are you going with your surgeon career? And so, again, it's just another example um, where everybody has an impact through whatever interaction you have with a student, it's going to leave some sort of impact that you may not even be aware of. And so I like this example because it is an example of a good relationship um, and just one little slight offhanded comment or laugh can really affect that and change the trajectory of where that person is going. Um, but at the end of the day, all of these influences come into play. And as educators in the Pacifica space, we really want to see something like this. We want to see a student thriving, graduating with their university cap on and you know adorning that piece of artwork that has a lot of hard work behind it and so as you go away from this I hope that you can sort of remind yourself of the impact that you have with your students but also 
maybe take this analogy away to your peers and your colleagues who may not understand the importance of the work that we do. Um, they might be one of those teachers who has a really good uh, relationship with the students, but isn't aware that when they said a certain thing, uh, it really put them off. So is that then our responsibility to step in and say, hey, this is what happened. Maybe you could approach it in a different way. Um, so yeah, that is me for today.